Everyone, a warm virtual welcome to all of you that have logged on. My name is Suda David Wilk, and on behalf of GMF Berlin, I'd like to thank you for joining us for this month's Transatlantic Tuesday. This month, we've reached the three year anniversary of the Transatlantic Tuesday series. Uh, we started this out as a monthly series to discuss topics pertinent to the transatlantic relationship. And now that um, some of the pandemic restrictions have eased up here in Berlin, we're actually gonna switch the format around and return to a lot of in-person convening here in Berlin, but we will surely be, um, we will certainly think about opening it up to a wider audience from time to time um, so that we can continue uh, the series of transatlantic Tuesdays on both sides of the Atlantic. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us through this series over the past three years, and also our, our business alliance for support of these series. Um, and as usual today, as in the past, we're gonna begin our conversation with a short moder moderated discussion, um, and then open it up to Q&A from all of you. Please use the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen, and the questions will um, queue up automatically. And now without further ado, I'd like to pass on the baton to my colleague, Jonathan Katz, who is a senior fellow and director of the Democracy Initiatives at GMF. Jonathan, over to you. So thank you and, and congratulations on, um, on so many years of, of hosting such important uh, conversations. Uh, and it's also, uh, it's great to be able to shift from virtual to in person, but virtual hopefully will still be a, a mode to connect and communicate. And uh, for the German Marshall Fund in the United States, um, Ukraine and the current situation on the ground in Ukraine is of critical importance. And so today we're really um, lucky to to build on the initial conversation that we're having. This is this on the record just discussion, which will also include a Q and A portion of. Uh, of the discussion as well. And we'll ask for, for those of you who do have an interest to ask questions, to use your Q&A uh, button below. And we'll get to that after we start with our speakers. So if I could do a quick introduction of our two speakers, and I wanna thank them so much for, for joining us today. Both are incredibly busy. Uh, both have um, demanding and challenging uh, jobs right now. Uh, both in terms of what's happening internally in Ukraine uh, and from in Kiev, but also uh, also in terms of the work that's being done to both track and understand militarily what is happening on the ground uh, in Ukraine, uh, which I think right now, uh, when you look at where we are in we're really in midwinter, we're only a few weeks from the anniversary of the start of, of Russia's a full-scale invasion, a legitimate uh, war, and uh, that there are challenges that we see right now on the ground. We see allies uh, trying to meet the demands of what Ukraine is looking for and needing to put in place to both uh, to provide defensive uh, support, but also to be able to go on the offensive. And then there's also what Russia and Moscow is doing right now and planning for including what many are concerned about, which is a spring offensive or maybe earlier a winter spring offensive. So we're going we're gonna to get into these uh, challenging topics. Uh, and I thank again our two speakers for joining us. And if I'm going to do a brief introduction uh, just to read a little bit of their bio for you. And then I'm going to turn to our speakers for an opening question. Again, thank you to everybody who's joined, who's participating today. Sorry, I've got a little bit of a a frog in my throat um, for the cold um, uh, over the last couple of days. So bear with me as well with the scratchy voice. Um, first off, I want to welcome Katerina uh, Stefanenko, uh, who is a Russia analyst on the Russia and Ukraine portfolio at the Institute for the Study of War um, from Kiev. Uh, she focused her academic and professional career on investigating the implications of Russia's hybrid and dis disinformation and warfare on Ukraine and conflict resolution in Eurasia. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, one of the first questions I'm going to certainly turn to you is about some of the re recent analysis of the Institute for the Study of War on sort of this potential for what you see as a potential spring uh, spring offensive that many analysts are all pointing to and government officials as well. Next, I just want to turn to Alessia Vasilenko, is a member of the Parliament of Ukraine, 
um, her party Holis, uh, which champions liberal dem democratic values and promotes European integration as the youngest opposition party in parliament. Um, MP Vasilenko sits on the parliament's environmental committee, chairs the subcommittee on climate change, uh, and at the outset of the war, Russia's war of aggression, um, which is coming up on the anniversary, uh, has become one of the strongest voices for Ukrainian perspectives and in international media, uh, and has a deep background in international relations, and has been doing incredible work at highlighting and promoting the needs of Ukraine uh, right now as this war uh, continues as we reach this year anniversary. And Leslie, if I could, if I could turn to you again, thank you both of you for joining today. Um, the perspective from uh, President Zelensky's government, from the Parliament right now, can you maybe just tell us, you know, with this anniversary coming up, um, it's not one that uh, any of us hope to to see or have. Can you tell us about what you see right now as the state of uh, the mindset of Kiev and all of this, and the government in terms of its approach? to addressing the military challenges. There's a tremendous amount of focus, obviously, on Bakhmut challenges uh, in the East. Um, the uh, Even some recent gains uh, by Russia in the East. And after a fall uh, of, of gains, of Ukrainian gains, including Kherson, uh, which was so significant, um, and Ukrainians have been extraordinarily valiant uh, in addressing all these challenges and have been uh, successful at ensuring that partners and allies are meeting the demands of what Ukraine needs. So I wanted to just maybe turn it over to you first um, and maybe have you speak to what you see the state of mind is and keep maybe thoughts on the approach to this military challenges and the needs that you see um, that President Zelensky has been asking for. We've seen tanks uh, that have been agreed to be delivered, but it's going to take some time. You know, even Abrams tanks, which was quite significant um, to, to build new Abrams and to provide all the things that go with that takes months. Um, same thing with Leopards, uh, same things with Challenger tanks. And now you see the government asking for F-16s. And so there's always this need and it, uh, there's always a sense too, maybe uh, for many of us here uh, in the think tank and the thought leadership community or expert community that we're a step behind, that the West is a step behind in providing Ukraine what it needs, both for offensive and defensive needs. So I'm throwing a lot at you to start with, but it's really important right now because I think there's a perspective that, oh, yes, these tanks are coming. Ukraine is OK. And it, it it doesn't seem to meet what we're seeing in the media or the assessments um, that we're seeing from from organ, uh, from think tanks, including IS, ISW in terms of what they're saying. So I want to turn it over to you. Thank you so much again also for the work that you're doing uh, in an extraordinary circumstance. Um, and for you and your colleagues uh, in the RADA. So, to, over, Lesia, over to you. Jonathan, thank you. And uh, thank you for, for providing this platform also to speak and to discuss of the burning issues for Ukraine, but not just for Ukraine, but for the globe in general, for the world in general, if we're, we are uh, aspiring to have a long standing peace. Uh, now, you're absolutely right that very soon it's going to be 12 months, 12 months of the escalation of Russia's aggression, which has started almost nine years ago. And uh, this is something that uh, the world also needs to take note of, that Ukraine has been fighting for freedom, for democracy, for independence, not just for these last 12 months, but for almost a decade now. And uh, with that, I'd like to also reflect on another uh, point you offered for discussion is whether the West has been slow at reacting. And the truth is, yes, the West has been painfully slow at reacting to Russia's aggression, to the absolute blatant fact of aggression as an international crime, 
all the all the evidence that Russia is committing aggression against Ukraine was there back in uh, February and, and March 2014 with the annexation of Crimea. If you open the UN resolution up the 1975 one, which defines uh, what aggression is, you will see that Russia has met all the criteria by the book, point by point. But the reaction was very slow and the reaction was lacking from the West. And um, it's not just that Ukraine failed because we didn't have a strong enough army or because we weren't thinking uh, strategically enough about security threats or the defense system. That's, that's a topic all in itself and I'm happy to discuss this as well. But it's the fact that when there is a um, threat of war, when there is a threat of aggression, when there is a threat to international peace and security, there needs to be a reaction. First of all, there's the right to self-defense as it's proclaimed in the UN Charter. And second of all, there's a duty of a collective re reaction as also proclaimed in the UN Charter. And that duty is what is missing from the equation that, that was missing and that in parts is still missing. Now, going back, uh, going a bit forward, but back to almost 12 months ago to the 24th of uh, February and actually even a couple of months before that, um, I was uh, in uh, diplomatic de delegations and parliamentary delegations uh, to France and a couple of days before uh, the escalation started to New York, to UN headquarters. And uh, despite all the talk that there will be an escalation of Russia's aggression, there will be an all out invasion. At the question that uh, parliamentarians like myself presented to our colleagues from other countries as to, OK, and what are we all going to do about it? The answer was uh, basically implying that Ukraine should just give up, that there's no point in helping Ukraine and furnishing Ukraine with any kinds of weapons, in mobilizing alliances, anti-Putin alliances, for example, for Ukraine, because, well, Russia is the what second largest army in the world. It's 28 times as big as Ukraine. It spans across uh, 10 different uh, time zones. So there's no chance Ukraine can survive. So, well, just consider giving up. And to me, these kinds of answers and solutions, so to speak, they, they were just extremely offensive. And um, the preferred diplomatic way out back then, I remember, was saying that, look, uh, we are Ukrainians in Ukraine, and come what may, we are going to stand for Ukraine. But uh, we have seen this time and time again, the buildup of Russian troops along the borders, and at the end of the day, nothing happened. Well, uh, okay, I'm happy to publicly admit uh, that I was wrong. Actually, I'm not happy about this. I wish uh, that I was right, but um, uh, I was wrong in, in these predictions. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I was right about the fact that Ukraine and Ukrainians will continue standing. And I think the word that Ukraine learned is resilience, that Ukrainians like myself learned is resilience. And uh, most of us discovered this word from a completely different dimension. We didn't know we had it in us. And the world didn't know that it was possible to be so resilient. But when you're fighting for your life and when you're fighting for your very existence, you're fighting an existential war and you have no, no, no way but not to be resilient. But for us to be resilient and to continue standing, we need those weapons. And from day one, I felt myself uh, very much like uh, much of the government of Ukraine, like the president of Ukraine, like a kind of broken record or a parrot that just repeats the same words over and over again. Fighter jets, close the skies, tanks, um, at the end of the day, with every sing single uh, piece of weaponry and ammunition, Ukraine has managed to um, persuade the West to be giving uh, to be giving defense instruments to Ukraine. It's okay. Fighter jets are still pending, but it's a question of time. And again, going back to your uh, point about whether the West has been too slow, of course, the West has been too slow. It's obvious that it's a matter of time until uh, Ukraine gets the weapons it, it needs to fight off Russia, because at the moment, 
for Western democracy, Ukraine is the only instrument out there that can put a stop or at least a halt uh, to Russia's invasive imperialistic war. Uh, but stalling in furnishing the tanks, the ammunition that goes with it, the fuel supplies to Ukraine, and also uh, I'm just not talking just about the tanks, but about other weapons as well. It means that we are not um, uh, doing enough and fast enough to stop Russia. It goes for the training as well. Can you imagine through this year, through these 12 months, how many tank brigades could have been trained? How many uh, fighter jet pilots could have been trained? But every time this issue was raised, even when we tried to go into a discussion was, well, just start the training of our military. The answer was, what, what's the point? What's the point to invest if you're not, never getting these weapons? But the question was that it would be just a matter of time. Now, I just hope that the next request that Ukraine makes uh, are met in a more positive way, in a more receptive manner, understanding that time is of the essence and that enough was wasted already and that really it's crucial, critical, I don't know what other metaphor uh, or synonymous word to use, uh, that uh, Ukraine and the West wins. And for that, we need to mobilize the resources over the coming months and mobilize military resources, financial resources, human resources, everything to make sure that there is a victory for Ukraine. And for that, the West needs to not only stop wasting the time, but also to have the confidence to imagine what it will be like after Russia loses. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I thought that you were going to certainly say that that things have been slow uh, to get there, but Ukraine is resilience, absolutely, um, especially this winter, uh, given the, the uh, damage, extraordinary damage done to electricity grids, to cities. Um, but uh, I think the question about which I'll, I'll turn to to our next guest to speak to is about, you know, is about sort of the current state of where things stand sort of even on the on the battlefield too. Uh, let's see, because I think that it is true on one hand that there's certainly a request for this additional, um, you know, additional equipment too. But I think there's also people looking at this assessment of of the battlefield too. Um, and we I, I did want to ask you and sort of both of you about Ramstein Group and how, you know, how that, you know, how do you think that process is working um, to, to meet these needs uh, that you mentioned, uh, but also, um, you know, when we start to look ahead, you know, what resources are going to be needed down the road? And I'm glad that you mentioned this is not only just military, it's, um, it's budget support for Ukraine, uh, which is needed um, on a monthly basis, humanitarian assistance right now. Uh, and for GMF, we're focused on the the recovery aspect of it uh, to make sure that uh, that that Ukraine has the support it needs on that road as well. Uh, Katarina, can I speak to you uh, next? You, I, I just want to read from um, just read from uh, uh, you know sort of, uh, sort of a daily assessment um, that ISW does, and one of the the top key takeaway uh, from that assessment is that. Uh, Western Ukrainian and Russian sources. So we've got a lot of sources continue to indicate that Russia is preparing for an imminent offensive. And this supports an ISW assessment uh, that an offensive in the coming months is the most likely course of action. And um, this keeps popping up because it, let's say it goes to your what you're saying too, which is, hey, you got to move fast for us to be able to both defend ourselves. And then if we're thinking about you know what what it looks like in terms of winning this war, uh, military just militarily, um, and there's other key components to that. Uh, tell me, give give it. Can you just sort of walk us through what what you and your colleagues are saying and why you believe this is why you believe this is the case that there will be the spring offensive. And what I wanted to ask you too is is how you guys were assessing the needs of the Ukrainian military right now, given that this offensive is, uh, is maybe imminent. And, and, you know, I'll go back and I'll ask you the question too, from your assessments. And if you can answer this question too, is asking the same thing as Leslie, do you feel like there's this, this step behind that, you know, that, that somehow uh, Western partners of Ukraine, many have stepped up 
uh, to provide significant military assistance. U.S. has provided over $27 billion in assistance since the beginning of the war, which is a pretty extraordinary amount of assistance as somebody who's been in Washington for quite some time. Uh, but that Leopard tank uh, and the tank back and forth highlights the tensions within the alliance um, and the tensions between what Ukraine needs and needs now and what can actually be delivered. And there's multiple factors, including supply chain, availability, um, uh, compatibility. Leslie, you spoke to the issue of training. You know, why weren't these trainings happening earlier when they could have been happening earlier? You know, maybe these, these should have been happening even before the war. Um, why didn't these things happen when they, they should have happened? So I'm going to lay a lot uh, on you to, you know, on the ISW assessment, which I think is probably the one thing that is 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 in the topic in the news right now that is like top level concerns for governments, for the Ukrainian government and for partners in Ukraine right now. So over to you. Yeah, I think I want to start with um, answering the second part of your question, uh, which is in the West, we've seen uh, the narrative of a stalemate that Ukraine is ongoing the stalemate period after they have liberated Kherson and um, Kharkiv, um, Western Kherson Oblast and Kharkiv Oblast. I fundamentally disagree with this. Ukrainians have been signaling that they were preparing for counteroffensives in the winter. Um, there are several factors that did not play into this um, idea. The first one is, uh, of course, we need more Western uh, support at that time to conduct uh, maneuver warfare in um, in Kharkiv Oblast and the Spotova Kremina line, we of course needed additional tanks, which are now just pledged um, and will take some time to arrive, as Lisa pointed out. Um, and then, of course, the winter conditions. Uh, we predicted that if winter was harsh, Ukrainians would be able to use the uh, frozen ground, the uh, during frost zone, to um, conduct their maneuver warfare um, in a more successful way than Russians would, given that Russians have showed significant uh, challenges with uh, both uh, conducting maneuver warfare after they wasted a lot of their tanks and their, a lot of their artillery um, in the first phase of the war, uh, but also because Ukrainians have adopted to the terrain a lot um, more um, sufficiently throughout this campaign. Um, now, currently, we're seeing that Russia is trying to seize the initiative on the front line. And um, in, in doing that, they're trying, they're planning for a decisive offensive operation. We have observed several indicators uh, throughout um, since um, the declaration of the mobilization. Uh, first, we have seen the change in command, uh, namely appointing commanders to specific sectors of the front line, uh, the return of Gerasimov and the return of the conventional forces. Uh, Russia had increasingly relied on the regular forces throughout the summer, which had led Ukrainians, um, had also benefited Ukrainians um, to conduct affairs of offensive, um, counteroffensive operations um, in Kharkiv as well as in Kherson um, in the summer. We are also seeing that Russia is conserving troops. So um, Russia had um, mobilized 300,000 uh, mobilized men. Um, but they kept around 150,000, um, and those are currently ongoing training and are some committed to the Luhansk uh, front line. Uh, we are also seeing uh, the emergence of certain spoiling attacks uh, that are taking place in Zaporizhia Oblast as well as um, Western Donetsk Oblast. The information space uh, informating over the potential uh, offensive operations from Belarus, which we assess is very unlikely. Um, and that all leads me to a point, um, and also there's um, uh, the Russian MOD is trying to introduce professionalization me methods for um, their armed forces, uh, which signals that they're really trying to um, get together and try to fix the, the campaign flaws that have been introduced since February 24. Um, the most likely offensive operation for Russia at this point is the Spatova Kriminal line in, in the direction of Liman. Liman is in the, the western, uh, eastern Donetsk Oblast, like north, northeastern Donetsk Oblast. Um, and that is the ground that uh, Russians have lost um, over September, October time period. Um, and with the further objective of getting to the front of the administrative borders of Donetsk Oblast, 
uh, which Gerasimov has outlined in his December 22 speech um, as the short term objective of this operation. Now, is this operation going to be successful in the long term, given that uh, Russian uh, campaign has been severely flawed and they've also wasted a lot of their resources uh, throughout this 12 months? Um, we are likely assessing that um, this attack will culminate for several reasons. Um, the first one is Russians have a very short window for an attack. They're essentially may be repeating the same erroneous assumptions um, as they have done in the past uh, in the past two uh, the past twelve months. Um, essentially, they are trying to commit themselves to a time period of um, February and March. Uh, which are the last kind of seasons of winter before the rain season become, uh, begins in April. Um, April season uh, has been detrimental to a lot of Russian advances. Um, we've seen the culmination of Russian advances in the Izum area around April, May, um, after they, they breached Izum um, in Kharkiv Oblast, um, as well as um, the challenges that they've experienced in maneuver warfare. There's also some fundamental issues that Russia is continuing to experience, namely that they don't have untapped reserve, uh, reserves. Um, they, all of their conventional forces have been committed in some capacity to this front line and will now need to increasingly rely on mobilized forces to conduct assaults. Um, these forces are not as effective in conducting assaults as um, someone who has been a reservist or a professional officer uh, and the degree of their training remains very questionable, um, especially given that they committed some forces to um, some forces to Belarus to train, um, which indicates that they don't they don't have sufficient training capacity. Um, and this uh, this also can prove that Russia has issues with assessing the time and space um, correlation, meaning that. We, in the past, have tracked that they set these deadlines for themselves to reach the administrative um, borders of um, Donetsk Oblast or Luhansk Oblast, but have repeatedly failed. And I'm afraid that might be the same case for them again, uh, where they might be over, um, overestimating their powers to um, conduct this uh, operation in the two months that are um, still beneficial for uh, maneuver warfare. Um, we're also seeing lack of shells. Uh, Russians are blew a lot of their arsenal on the Severodonetsk Lysychansk front lines, um, and also had um, are using manpower waves, kind of like a World War One uh, strategy, uh, namely Wagner forces, um, to continue very small tactical advances. Um, Will Russia be able to gain some territory? Of course. Uh, I mean, we're seeing some advances in the Bukhodar area. However, we assess that those are not going to be operational significant in the long term. Now, the West needs to understand that uh, this attack and its culmination, um, because it does require significant resources and planning that Russia has shown that they've not been able to do so, um, might be a good ground for Ukrainian counteroffensive. And that's where Western support is um, crucial for Ukraine, especially over late spring and summer of 2023. Uh, previous culmination, Russian culmination around Severodonetsk, this Trump area had led Russia to um, seize its offensive operations um, on the numerous theaters, um, you know, including Kharkiv Oblast, as well as uh, the Nyev Oblast, uh, Kherson Oblast, and the Parisia Oblast, and effectively froze the, uh, the front line. Um, there was also that narrative emerging of a stalemate. You know, Ukrainians are not doing anything, and Russians are not doing anything, so it's a stalemate. Um, however, that's where Western support came in, and we received HIMARS, and HIMARS for um, and HIMARS and the um, 155 uh, millimeter um, artillery, which were crucial in Ukrainians' capacity to conduct um, well-planned, um, long-term counteroffensive operations that were proven to be successful. So the key takeaway that I, I guess I want our audience to, to take um, is this offensive operation will still have some flaws. Uh, it, it, it's not going to be as smooth as 
we imagine, I mean, Russia needs to completely reconfigure its forces, which they are setting to do, but that will take at least until 2026, according to their predictions. Not sure how accurate that is going to be. Um, this, uh, this, uh, uh, the culmination of this offensive operation um, could be very beneficial for Ukraine to regain the initiative um, on other front lines, uh, whether it's Zaporizhia, whether it's continuing counteroffensive operations in Slava or Kremina line, um, or you know, going onto the left bank or Shosan Oblast to Crimea. Um, the culmination of this um, count, uh, offensive operation in um, with use of Western uh, Western equipment, so tanks are arriving, um, could lead to more Ukrainian uh, ability to maneuver and regain more territories. So that's the brief overview of what we're tracking, um, as well as our assessment. Yeah, thank you. Um, and sort of interesting to hear about sort of perspective on sort of, uh, and I guess questions of what, what lessons has Russia uh, learned from your perspective in terms of the failures um, over the last several months, uh, and how is that feeding into you know what what's feeding into the decision making process? You didn't raise Wagner and the role of Wagner, um, you know, in in this space as well, and sort of internal political tensions uh, with respect to Wagner and its role in the Russian military. But I wanted to you know I did one question I posed, and I think it's. I guess a question some people too is just the state of Ukrainian military, sort of lessons learned already, and sort of how are they, have they adapted and changed? And obviously a lot is being, uh, let's see, a lot is being thrown at the Ukrainian military, not only to to be on the defensive and sort of, as you said, I mean, I, I think it's unfair to look at every, uh, you know, every whether it's Soldar or these other skirmishes to see, you know, sort of change to say that that means that the tide of the, of the conflict is turning in one direction and the other based on one um, on on sort of what it, what took place because if you're looking at Ukraine in March of last year, you would have thought, hey, you know, this is you know this is a, a situation that was not reversible that Ukraine would not be able to go on to counteroffensive and they have. So let's see how is I wanted to ask you too, how is um, how is uh, the Ukrainian government and you dealing with uh, and how is support look like for Ukrainian military? internally to be able to to do so much and i know that it's backed back by ukrainian citizens i do a lot of work with ukrainian civil society and support for and it's as if the whole country is is mobilized inside and out and i wanted to ask you about that and then we'll, we'll get to some of the questions we have in the chat box but to hear sort of this assessment of what's taking place um and i wanted to ask you about the state of of Ukraine and Ukrainian military, and maybe for both of you, sort of that assessment, one from maybe from the ISW perspective, um, because so much is being asked of, of Ukraine's military to do so much. And I think it's extraordinary to be able to train on, on sort of NATO and Western equipment in sort of the middle of a, of a conflict and to be able to turn around and do the things Ukraine is doing, and I've long been an advocate for Ukraine's membership in NATO. This is a, you know, I've always felt like this was, a, you know, sort of building the case of why Ukraine is, in essence, becoming a NATO, a NATO military, and and making sort of that case. Uh, Leslie, can I turn it over to you? Just talk about that, and then I want to, you know, sort of maybe, um, you know, maybe do it quickly, and then we'll get to these three questions because we only have a a short time together today. Uh, to speak to such a um, challenging um, topic with so many complexities uh, to it. So, Leslie, over to you. Okay, as I'm uh, in uh, the British Parliament where I'm doing this, uh, this talk from, and there's a, a bell calling on for the vote. Uh, so, I hope that it will be over soon that you can hear me clearly enough. But maybe uh, if you want to start with Katarina. Uh, just so that we have a clearer answer. Okay. Yeah, I can briefly talk to it. As a matter of policy, we don't really assess Ukrainian capabilities at ISW, given that it's counter uh, counterintuitive almost and uh, not very beneficial uh, for exposing Russian flaws. However, Ukrainians have proven time and time again 
their ability to integrate Western equipment into their um, combat operations, um, whether it's NASAMs, whether it's HIMARS, Javelins, um, they've effectively used each and one of these um, provisions to um, conduct counteroffensives, to liberate occupied territories. Ukrainians are playing a long game. They are not throwing their manpower the way that Wagner convicts are thrown. Um, they are um, playing it strategically. I believe one of the uh, colonels today, uh, Sergei Chiravati, said, said a beautiful quote um, saying that we have slowed down our advances in the Svatova Criminal Line and Juan Oblast for the sole reason that it doesn't make strategic sense to push in bad weather as well as in bad conditions. Um, so Ukraine, um, there was a lot of skepticism when oh, going on around the Kherson counteroffensive, uh, with a lot of people saying, we're not seeing combat on the ground going and pushing for Kherson city. Why is that? And Ukrainians were playing on a smart side and they were using HIMARS to completely annihilate uh, Russian logistic lines. And so in that sense, uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian military needs to get the credit for uh, being superior in their um, ability to operate with all of the resources, the limited resources that they have, but also to plan ahead and have the, the strategic vision for um, their operation. Right. I, I'm, happy, I'm happy to jump in on that. Um, uh, so with, with the Ukrainian military, the morale stands high. Uh, the same was in 2014, the same was uh, in February, there were literally queues to uh, the military commissariats, or these are these recruitment centers, and men and women alike were uh, lining up, wanting to be drafted, wanting to go in and do whatever they could for their country, and the situation still stands. Uh, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you're trying to do that little bit extra for your country so that tomorrow you can wake up in Ukraine and so that your children can also continue living and building their life in a free uh, and independent Ukraine. So this is this is the motivation behind it. There's also, uh, in Ukrainian society, uh, there's also uh, an understanding of freedom on a molecular level. So there's, uh, you can take away... Uh, all kinds of resources from the Ukrainian people, but you cannot even attempt to take away freedom. That will backfire on anyone. Uh, and it, it may sound as something very abstract, as again, something like a metaphor, but it is not. It really is the way, the way that most Ukrainians feel. Um, and finally, there's also in Ukrainian society, there's a very deep understanding of justice. Uh, and what is happening right now is somebody breaking into our home um, and essentially saying, now it's mine. And you just go away and stand aside and uh, watch me steal everything that's yours. Uh, watch me rape your wife or watch me uh, torture your children. And that's just not the way it's going to go. Uh, so uh, th this is retranslated into the motivation of our military needs and of our soldiers, men and women alike, again. Uh, the success of any military operation is only partial if there's no mo motivation. And there will be no success, even if you have the top equipment, if you, if you have the most comfortable uniform, the best food supplies and medical supplies. The motivation needs to be there. The morale needs to be uh, high. And the morale is, is still very much there and very much high in the, in the Ukrainian army. This is something to, to understand. Uh, this also explains why the training missions going on uh, abroad outside of Ukraine are so successful and why our military units are able to pick up so quickly on all the details of operations of totally new equipment. And sometimes colleagues from all the different countries that are helping Ukraine right now wonder and uh, are completely puzzled as to how the Ukrainian army has been able to have such a line of successful counteroffensives was a potpourri, essentially, a mix ma mishmash of uh, different weapons, different ammunition. Um, having said that, uh, this, this is what we have had to deal with. It's not by choice. It's, 
the best that we got and that we had to make do with what we got. Um, and this, uh, this was tactical, a tactical approach. In my uh, opinion, maybe Katarina, you can correct me, I am uh, not nearly as much of a military expert as you are, but uh, in my view, this, this was tactics. If we are to think about strategy, we need to, to think about uh, defense and security in a systemic way. Now, Ukraine is a key component to global defense and security, and especially to a stable defense and security system in Europe. We are in the middle of it. And for us to be uh, able to be that key component, we need to be able to defend ourselves, to defend ourselves from the imminent threats. And right now, the number one threat for global uh, security frameworks comes from Russia. And Russia is that threat. Now, uh, we cannot rely on the, I'm sorry, but unreliable supplies of weapons that are coming in from the States, from Canada, from all over the world. Because today they are pledged and tomorrow something happened and happens in the political milieu and the situation changes. That's, uh, that's not ideal, neither for Ukraine nor for global defense and security. Uh, the other issue we haven't really raised here is the production lines. Um, the uh, global defense and security sector is such that there's just not enough of these weapons uh, and moreover of the ammunition to go around. Now, uh, the solution lies in the building up of the production. And uh, for us, uh, for Ukrainians, and it's also in the interests of the West, is to build up this production um, in the West uh, of Ukraine, or at least on the eastern borders of Poland, so that there's... Uh, uh, there's systemic supply, there's reliable supply into Ukraine, and that also we don't have to make do with, with a, a mishmash, that, that we have uh, set production lines of the weapons, of the ammunition, of the uh, armored vehicles, transport systems, and defense systems that work in Ukraine, that are specific to the terrain of Ukraine, and that can counter the specific threats coming from Russia and Russia's aggression. And another component that I'd like to touch here, uh, upon here, it's uh, the, uh, uh, how Russia is coping. Um, now, Katerina has mentioned that the supplies are being uh, depleted in Russia, and that is a fact, that is true, that is a heartwarming fact. Uh, but also, Russia has started to make these alliances with um, uh, other totalitarian regimes, such as North Korea, Iran, well, the, the alliances were there, they, they just started enhancing them. And possibly some other uh, Middle Eastern uh, countries and other countries in the global South who are furnishing Russia still with components and elements critical to their military defense and security sector and to the production of weapon lines. Now, uh, this is uh, another challenge uh, for uh, not just for Ukraine, but for the West is to go out there and do the diplomatic talking and do the diplomatic persuading and make the case that really it's in the interest of everyone globally to put an end to imperialistic aspirations of one state. Yeah, I think that last point is particularly important, too, is that, you know, uh, how Russia is, uh, you know, uh, going around strictures on uh, whether it's on imports of technology, uh, turning to new partners and allies, including Iran, uh, North Korea, uh, to meet its uh, its needs. And so the diplomatic part of this, while we're focused sort of on the military context and the battlefield, includes it's pretty complex also globally as well. Um, and there has been this challenge too. Um, and where we typically find this is where Russia has uh, like-minded partners, uh, corrupt authoritarian countries um, that or supply lines that seek to uh, fill in these needs. So no doubt there's a, a strong need to, um, to not only to address these military needs, but to step up diplomacy, sanctions, um, other support that that is needed uh, to address these challenges. Absolutely. Um, we're we're almost at sort of the end, and I want to give both of you sort of a minute to close um, in terms of uh, final final thoughts. And, and right now, I want to start with you too, just what you want people to walk away in terms of the current conflict on the ground, the assessment of ISW, 
and sort of the things that that are going to be really important for people to be watching, you know, and what you guys are really uh, looking at right now that that really maybe tell the tale of what's happening. Uh, and you guys do so much, including the reporting on other other uh, other suppliers of Russian, uh, you know, military needs, and sort of exposing exposing that as well, which I think is particularly important, including as diplomats try to, you know, sort of think through how to respond to that uh, those Western allies of, and not only Western but global allies of of Ukraine and and sort of concerns about what Russia is doing. So can I turn to you, and then Leslie, I want to turn to you just what you want uh, everyone to take away with as we approach this uh, one year in terms of what's needed um, and anything, you know, obviously you're in London right now, I'd be interested, you know, sort of that message, what you're talking to counterparts in the UK parliament about, you know, when it comes to what's taking place in Ukraine and how do you keep those partners like the UK, United States and Europe really committed, continually committed and understanding the motivations of the Ukrainian people and government at this moment. So, Kenwin, can I start with you first, just to give us uh, sort of that that ending note? Of course, yeah. I think Ukraine is going to be embarking upon pretty challenging two, three months, and I don't want anyone in the West to be discouraged when they see uh, Russian forces advancing to a small settlement, for example. That is something that we saw in the past, um, especially with the doomsday reporting about Tyrodonetsk and Sichang, which had proven to be, um, it was a significant loss. However, it was also a ground for Ukrainians to recoup in different directions and restart their counteroffensives. So um, the point I want everyone to walk away with is that, yes, some, sometimes we're gonna see reporting that is not going to favor Ukrainians. Um, and that is okay. It happens. It's war. Um, it's a strategic game uh, between which grounds are going to be operational significant, operationally significant and which are not. And uh, I want everyone to know that um, where there's a bad uh, stripe, you know, um, there's always going to be a good side um, after that. So as Russia tries to do this, they're engaging in very costly maneuvers that is not going to sustain a long um, a sustain a long offensive operation. But I also want to warn everyone that Putin is preparing for a protracted war. This is not going to be over after a def uh, this offensive operation. To him, this war is, uh, he interprets the, this war as an existence, as, a, um, as an existential threat to Russia and his rule. Um, so Ukraine will need prolonged uh, consistent Western support to win this war. Um, and uh, the longer that the uh, the longer Russia can play this um, arbitration war, the uh, the longer um, it is, the longer this war is going to continue. So the, the sooner Ukraine gets the necessary resources um, to stop Russian advances, um, the faster this war will end. Important points, and I think Mr. Putin really wants the West to to be so fatigued uh, by this um, that you know uh, the tough job of sort of uh, continuing to get the support will 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 fade. And let's see, you're on the other end, which is pushing against both disinformation about warfare and the current situation. Obviously, engaging with counterparts in, parla in Parliament, but in governments. Um, so I wanted to give you the the last word uh, and maybe speak to you know to the from your perspective, how, you know, what, what the messaging is on your end right now um, and listening to uh, what's just been said. Now, this is going to be difficult with the bell going in the background, but- That's hope, okay, do, do your best. Okay, I will. I, I will, I, I'd actually want to continue uh, slightly from what Katerina has said. Uh, that the next uh, two, three months, maybe even up to summer, half a year, will be extremely difficult for Ukraine. And you will see a lot of information out there and disinformation. And uh, the biggest appeal that I'm making everywhere I go is to just keep talking about Ukraine, keep conversations like this going, keep providing the platform. Because as soon as there is a vacuum, as soon as there's a... Uh, informational fatigue around Ukraine, Russia will be on it, jumping to fill the gap, 
to fill to, to fill that bubble. And Russia is extremely good at uh, protracted conflicts. That term has sounded here. Katerina, thank you for this. Russia is a master at protracted conflicts, uh, at tiring out its opponents and also anyone who's helping the opponents. And we must be aware of this. We have the lessons of not so far ago of 2014, 2015 to guide us around this Russian tactic. Uh, together and only together in the unity of the democratic countries in this world, we will we are able and we have enough resources to withstand uh, Russia's aggression. But every delay in uh, seeing Russia's aggression for what it really is and seeing Russia for what it really is, is causing democracy to be fragile. Uh, now, something to take away. It's uh, the policy of the West has long been Russia first. It's been like this since 1991, since the breakup of the Soviet Union. It's high time to change that. And we see the consequences of not changing that. That's, um, I, you know, countries falling apart, people dying, innocent women, children being civilian casualties of war, a food crisis, a global food crisis, and uh, much more consequences stemming from it. Um, and essentially a war in the middle of Europe in the middle of the 21st century, which is just wrong. Uh, now, that policy of Russia first needs to be replaced by a policy of democracy first. And we can only do it again in solidarity. So some concrete steps to take. Yes, keep talking about Ukraine. Yes, keep talking about the best humanitarian aid for Ukraine, which is weapons for Ukraine, which is defense system, military, uh, air defense systems, on the ground defense systems, marine defense systems. This is everything that Ukraine needs. Also, uh, you know, the consequences that Russia needs to bear with the aggression, confiscation of Russian arrested assets that sit in central banks, that sit in the Bank of England, this is issues that we are raising. And as a form of a sanction is, uh, is also isolation of Russia from international platforms. Ukraine should have more space, but Russia should, ha should have less space. And the first platform to consider should be the United Nations. The biggest aggressor, the biggest threat to security has no right, uh, moral or legal, to sit on the uh, Security Council and to hold veto power and to hold the whole of the UN um, hostage. After this talk, I'm giving a talk at uh, LFE here in London on uh, actually the legal basis for excluding Russia from the UN and for Russia's illegal um, membership in the UN. And I think this is a way for a way to pursue to make sure that the aggressor first uh, is stopped with its aggression and that it is also isolated until uh, until the country becomes safe for its neighbors and safe uh, for global uh, framework of defense and security. Thank you, um, Karina and Lesia, thank you so much for joining us. You know, on your last points, I think uh, just to close out are so important. One, uh, the idea of continuing to have uh, the types of platforms like Transatlantic Tuesdays and GMF and others to continue to have these conversations because the uh, obviously there's there's a lot of changes, complexities to these issues to keep talking about it. Uh, uh, the issue of Russian assets or of accountability, war accountability, including International Crimes Tribunal, I think is really important to put forward right now um, and uh, holding Russia accountable is also part of, of both security and global security to be clear that this type of war crimes and atrocities um, are unacceptable um, in the international community. And certainly the UN and other international bodies where Russia sits, um, where they do not deserve to sit, um, should be part of the diplomatic strategy of, of engagement of Ukraine and partners as well. So, Leslie, you're absolutely right. Um, and uh, I think I know from here from German Marshall Fund and partners that we work with, Ukraine will continue to be and what's taking place will continue to be of the highest priority, um, including support for Ukrainians um, on the ground um, in sort of in different ways. 
but also uh, I did raise, and I think we'll see in London, and maybe while you're there now, is um, is a, the London Reconstruction and Recovery Conference, and, and certainly from GMF, we're hopeful that that conference and then the lead up to it will address some of the issues that you're talking about, including assets um, and what to do with them. Um, and I think it is a, is largely about holding Russia accountable for what it's doing in terms of war crimes and destruction. Uh, and so um, I think I'm right there with you, Leslie, on this. And we look forward to working with both of you, um, with uh, Rada, um, ISW, and partners to um, to really uh, dig deep on these issues, and but also to provide some recommendations uh, to those uh, those opinion and policymakers that are thinking very hard about how to best support Ukraine. So on behalf of GMF, again, sorry for my, my froggy throat, uh, we, we, we really appreciate you joining us, even in the middle of all the bells in parliament, which I think means it might mean a call to vote. Um, I worked in Congress, so I know those bells quite well. And thank you to our audience and participants who joined us today uh, to listen in to uh, this uh, one, uh, some analysis, brilliant analysis, um, sign up for ISW. I'm a, I'm a fan for daily briefs and updates. And Leslie, we hope to get some more updates from you on the things that you're thinking about, including uh, the UN and what what you're thinking about and how to um, uh, weaken the ability of Russia to use its position, which it shouldn't have, correct, uh, in these spaces uh, to prevent um, accountability and justice um, and to hold Russia responsible for its actions. So I want to thank Callie Starn uh, as well, who organized this, Suda, David Wilp, my colleague uh, in Berlin, and all my colleagues who helped pull this together. Thank you again to our two guests. And I wish everybody a good, uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, if you're joining us from Washington or from, uh, from the West Coast. Uh, thank you so much and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.